Unfound is a podcast that is now four years old. It has an interview-based format and concentrates on the facts, not the theories. Today, and for the sixth time, I will take you back to the beginning, then right up to the present, as I cover new updates on many of Unfound's cases. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. One of the most common questions I get, both privately and on the YouTube live show, why missing persons cases, Ed? And why don't you cover other kinds of true crime on the program? It's a good question, and I'll answer it. It's because, to paraphrase JFK, we do things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In fact, if you'll go back to my interview with Tad Tobias, he called missing persons cases the hardest of the hardest of the hardest. And he has way more experience with them than I do. I love the personal challenge, just like I've embraced the challenge of getting over the yips in disc golf over the last five years. I could have given up, but I didn't. And I was graciously rewarded this past weekend with my best round ever. But to investigate and report on missing persons cases, you have to be a happy warrior. You have to accept the difficulties and realize that many of the cases you cover may never be solved. To quote the talking heads, this ain't no party, this ain't no disco, this ain't no fooling around. There could be long stretches when nothing is revealed. No one is found while suspects, probable killers, are walking around free men and women. Yet, this is the reason we do these update episodes, that it's worth it to take a serious interest in these disappearances, because there is progress being made. Positive movement is happening. And we at Unfound ask you to recognize this and make the decision to get involved. And now, a summary of Unfound. I'm going to give a shout out to Megan Good and her site charlieproject.org, even though I didn't need to use it for this particular episode. Unfound was born out of the idea that the public should know as much as it can about missing persons cases. I, as the host, go about getting you all the facts I can by interviewing those people who are closest to the case, usually family members. However, we've also had bloggers, reporters, and private investigators on the program, but only two law enforcement officers. Why? Because the police usually don't want to tell me anything. And unlike many programs that splice in the host's questions and comments after, Unfound plays every interview as it was recorded, minus the mistakes. The interviews are played in this manner because I believe you, the listeners, need to be reassured that nothing is taken out of context and that you are listening to a conversation like any two people might have. The first call I ever made representing myself as the host of Unfound was to Mary Lyle, mother of Suzanne Lyle. The call happened sometime in late July 2016. I was at my parents' place in Pennsylvania. I can remember standing in their bedroom with the door shut for privacy when I made the call. That's a true story. She surely had no idea who I was, and at that point I had no history of ever interviewing anybody. I can kind of rely on my extensive resume now. But at the time, I was just a guy on the other end of the phone line. I was very nervous. However, Mary couldn't have been friendlier. And I would say these days we talk about once every two months. And she has been very supportive of Unfound. I can't even begin to tell you. Sending several future guests my way. I hope to meet her in person sometime soon. That conversation was followed by a call to Patrick Marker, the guest for the Joshua Guimond episode. 
then Tim Wright for the Ben Charles Padilla episode. And before I knew it, Unfound had gained some momentum. Probably the next big thing that happened for Unfound that pushed it forward was a listener kind of becoming my right-hand woman to find guests for the program. Emily, you've heard me mention her many times before, is responsible for finding probably half the guests you've heard on Unfound since May of 2017. Her passion and compassion make her excellent at what she does. She stays in contact with guests even after they've been on the program. Then, in December 2017, Unfound became linked with the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh. It carried Unfound on its website throughout 2018, and I helped them cover older missing persons cases in Western Pennsylvania through monthly articles. Along the way, Unfound has also picked up Cherie Biggs, researcher and overseer of both the Unfound live show on YouTube and the Unfound think tank. She is also the creator of the upcoming series, The Unfound Roundtable. Unfound also has Carrie Welburn and Heather Dobbins, administrators for the discussion group on Facebook. Heather is now also the manager of the Unfound store. Dr. Eric Grabowski, a personal confidant and independent researcher, and host of Unfound on the Ground. And the newest assistant, Natasha, who is in charge of the website, and the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube. There have been books, and newsletters, and t-shirts, and poll questions, the website, theunfoundpodcast.com, and most importantly, the respect and concern all of you continue to show for Unfound's many, many guests. Like the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth update episodes from the summer of 2018, April of 2019, September of 2019, December of 2019, and April of 2020, respectively, I'll be doing all the talking today. I'm Ed Denzel. I'm from Leechburg, Pennsylvania. I attended Grove City College, class of 1993. I graduated with a degree in business that I've never had to use. I've had all sorts of odd jobs, including magic show stage manager, printer and fax machine technician, department of transportation flag person, model, and Star Trek actor. I lived in Las Vegas from 1998 to 2011, Madeira Beach, Florida from 2011 to 2019, and I now live in Clearwater Beach. But Vegas is still my favorite city. Unfound News. I'm proud to announce that I will be a monthly guest starting in September on Dr. Grace Telesco's show that she is producing in conjunction with Nova Southeastern University. My first appearance on this program will be September 24th. It will be live and I think it will be broadcast over YouTube. I think. We'll be discussing the disappearance of Eric Alvarado. Next, Thanks to my podcast hosting company, Podomatic, you'll soon be able to find Unfound on Amazon Music and Audible. They were also the ones who got Unfound to be on Spotify. Podomatic has been Unfound's only hosting company. I highly recommend them. Finally, I've started some new map videos for old episodes of Unfound. They're now playing on Unfound's YouTube channel please check them out. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Deezer, Facebook, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on our podcast channel for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. Before I start going through all of these updates, I want to assure everyone that just because I am mentioning a certain case does not mean I believe Unfound has something to do with the new information. If I believe that to be a fact for a certain case, I will say so. Also, 
unfound does not scoop or plagiarize other people's work. So in some of these cases, there's work being done. I know what the work is. I know the progress being made. But I will allow the people who are actually doing the work to reveal their new information when they are good and ready. So if you haven't listened to an update episode before, let me just tell you how this all works. I do not have a script in front of me. All I have are the names of the cases that have updates and a few notes under each name. That's how I do this. If I were to type up a script with everything that I needed to say, like actual words and just reading, 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 it would take me probably weeks to type something like that up. So being that I'm not going to do it that way, I just put some notes and that kind of triggers what I want to say in my mind. And that's how we're going to do it. So if you hear some ums and uhs and errs and some pregnant pauses, the reason is because I'm not reading from a script. I'm just doing this off my off the top of my head, uh, just with just with some notes in front of me. So let's get started. We're going to be going from Unfound's oldest episodes up to the newest ones. So we're going to go from 2016 right up to the present 2020. Specifically, this episode is being recorded on August 26th, 2020. The first case I'm going to talk about is Jason Jolkowski's. Now, before you get too excited and thinking there is an update for him specifically, there is not, at least nothing that I could find. However, what came up just recently within the last maybe six weeks, Sheree and I... Um, we're talking about that, or I was thinking about it, then I spoke to her about it. And there is this other disappearance that some people believe is connected to Jason's, and that is the disappearance of Sam Sherman, who disappeared on July 19th, 2001, just a month or so after Jason disappeared, within a couple blocks of where Jason disappeared. At least that's where Sam was living at the time. Now, the bizarre part about all of this is that can't find anything out there about Sam Sherman. Um, I think I have an idea of the house that he might have been living in at the time that he disappeared, but can't find any records that he actually lived in that house. And if any of you know anything about his disappearance, anything at all, and there's, like I said, very little information, he allegedly went on a job interview and then disappeared after that. And I have to say it's been bugging me for a while. And so I finally, uh, Shri and I talked about it. And so currently she is filing a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request with the Omaha, Nebraska Police Department, an investigating agency, to find out what we can get regarding Sam's disappearance. Even if it's just one piece of paper, maybe at least saying who the person was who filed the report, that would, I think, open up a lot of um, different avenues of inquiry and tr maybe trying to track that person down and see what the relationship is between this person and Sam and get into a few more of the details. Where was he going? Who did he interview with? What company was it? What was going on at, at, at that time in his life? And is there any possibility that maybe Sam and Jason knew each other? I don't think anybody has tried to do that. And the reason I think that is because I've gone... Everywhere you can go on the internet looking for more information about Sam Sherman's disappearance and you just can't find any. Even on, for example, Web Sleuths, which is usually known for being, um, you know, a lot of theories, a lot of conjecture goes on there. But I do go there maybe once a month just to look something up. But even there, very, very little. So we're taking that on. Uh, Sheree is filing the paperwork. Uh, and... We'll see what happens. Uh, once again, I think this is a situation simply because 
he disappeared not long after Jason did, and they lived within a few blocks of each other. They disappeared in the same summer of 2001, two young men who disappeared. It might be nothing. It might be like the San Francisco Five, uh, Cameron Remmer and company, who all disappeared in San Francisco over the span of like three or four or five years within a block of each other. Uh, but in looking into that as much as I have, I can say that none of them are connected. It may very well be that Jason's and Sam's uh, aren't connected either, but I would surely like more information on it to just determine that uh, for myself. And I'm sure Sheree and the rest of the assistants will uh, take part in trying to determine that as well. Next, Andrea Bowman. Uh, the last time I did one of these updates was April of 2020. I do these every four months. And at the time, remains had been found on Dennis Bowman's property. And I think everybody believed that those remains would end up being Andrea's. That is true. Uh, they were identified as hers. And Dennis has been charged with Andrea's death. Also, during this time... Uh, he has pled guilty to the murder of Kathleen Doyle in Virginia in 1980. Uh, we here at Unfound uh, continue to believe that Dennis Bowman is a serial killer, and eventually their uh, authorities, whether in Virginia or Michigan or somewhere else, will find other victims of his. Uh, there's not much doubt in our mind. Um, so I think that, um, we should prepare for that. I'm not saying it's going to happen this year, but, uh, if I live to be, let's say 80 years old, so 30 years from now, I think that more deaths, murders will be connected to Dennis Bowman. I, uh, it still is something to me and we will be releasing, uh, an in memoriam for Andrea Bowman here shortly within the next week. And... What continues to um, amaze me, I guess is, is the word to use, is that even going back to my interview with Kathy back in 2016, she has always believed that Andrea's remains were on that property, even though there was no proof to think so. And it turns out that she was correct. And I have to give her full credit for that. She had an idea, and we now know that uh, she was right. And I, I have to believe in some ways is that had she not started to try to find her biological daughter, uh, that maybe Dennis Bowman would have gotten away with Andra's murder. Maybe nobody would have looked into it. Maybe nobody would have looked into Kathleen Doyle's uh, murder either, but I think the pressure that Kathy uh, continued to put on law enforcement, uh, they just couldn't uh, resist her, I guess is the proper way to put it. I think from just the general aspect of uh, missing person theory, uh, this fur furthers the idea, I think, that some of these disappearances, I'm going to say this right now, is that given that we now have Andrea Bowman's disappearance case that we now know is a murder and he she was found on her father's property and um of course we go back to zoe campus's murder by carlos what we believe to be who we believe to be carlos rodriguez on his property i'm inclined to believe that there are other disappearances that unfound is covered we've covered about 180 now where those remains are on personal property as well on the property of the murderer of the killer uh, I would never say out loud which ones I think those cases are, but I think given the percentages, given the statistics, I think it's fair to say that there are others that we've covered uh, where hopefully uh, remains will be found on the private property of uh, the suspect or a person of interest. So Andrea Bowman's disappearance is solved. Uh, he's been charged with her death. He is not I think admitted to it. He hasn't pled guilty or anything. I don't believe as of yet, but um, I think the next shoe to drop in this is going to be maybe his wife being charged as well. I know that is something that Kathy really wants uh, to happen 
too. Uh, you see her posts on Facebook, you know that to be true, and I agree with her. The next disappearance that I want to talk about is Christopher Hyde's. Uh, it turns out that his remains were found in 2004 in Hillsborough County, which is, if, you want to, if you're not from the Florida, Hillsborough County is essentially Tampa. That's across Tampa Bay from where I live. I live in Pinellas County, Clearwater, St. Petersburg. Tampa is to the east. Um, not a lot of information. It doesn't sound like uh, the police have given his sister Lila much information, but it seems that his remains were found not long after her family, or at least her and some of her family in Texas, uh, found out that he was missing. Um, he was identified this summer, but like I said, his remains were actually found way back in 2004. I think this is a situation where uh, the remains were so uh, decayed that no cause of death could be determined. I did read somewhere where he might have been found in some sort of uh, abandoned trailer. I don't know if that means like uh, a mobile home or does that mean a, a trailer that goes on the back of an 18-wheeler? I, I don't know. But at some point, uh, in 2004, over in Hillsborough County, his remains were found. Why it took all this time to be identified? Uh, the DNA identification question is something that continues to come up. Why do some identifications happen very, very quickly and then some take um, forever or not done at all? It's a very good question. I don't have an answer for you. Um, the big question, I think, specifically in Christopher's uh, situation, his disappearance and death, is he was supposed to be with his father in Orlando, and then there was a story that he might have been seen down in Sarasota, Bradenton area, which is nowhere close to Orlando, it's, and it's south of me, south of Tampa. And then his remains are found in Tampa. How did he get from Orlando? Are we to believe that he actually was seen in, in the Sarasota, Bradenton area? And how did he get to Hillsborough? Was he walking? Was he hitching rides? Uh, did somebody uh, murder him and then bring his body from Orlando over here or from Sarasota, Bradenton up to here? We just don't know. Um, but his remains have been found, but this could be one of those situations where um, we may never know what actually did happen to him. You have to remember that Christopher did have uh, some issues going on in his life. Um, I think he was learning disabled. And um, his father, did, if you'll go back to that interview, did not sound like the greatest guy in the world. And it might have been that Christopher was hanging around with some shady characters, characters in Orlando. And just got the feeling, I think, from the interview with Lila almost four years ago that Father really was not cut out uh, to be taking care of Christopher, even though that was the situation. Um, we're, just, uh, we're just not sure right at this point. It's very possible that Christopher ended up being homeless and, and died uh, from the elements here in Florida, not being able to get food or water. I, I just don't know. I'm, I'm completely speculating. But he was eventually found uh, in 2004 uh, in a trailer of some type, and his remains remained unidentified until the summer of 2020. Next disappearance, Esther Westenbarger. I'm sure this is one that is fresh in everybody's mind. Uh, mines, plural, uh, because we just recently did an immemorium for Esther and her disappearance, uh, the, um, the mystery of her disappearance came to an end in June of this summer, uh, June of 2020, when by total accident, um, some kids were fishing in a retention pond not far from where Esther was living at the time, and they happened to see something in the water. Police got called in, and they dragged her car out, and she was in it. 
the ignition, uh, the keys were in the ignition, the ignition was in the on position, and the car wasn't in, was in drive. And if you listened to that in memoriam in my summation for the in memoriam episode, played the original interview I did with her daughter Matilda, and then with a new summation afterwards, I think that we're just going to be have to settle on the idea that we're never going to know what happened that night. It could be she was drinking and driving. It could be that she fell asleep at the wheel, even though I understand it was only like a mile or mile and a half from where she was at that bar and where her car ended up. It could be that she had a heart attack while behind the wheel. Could be that she thought she was on a, a, a different road, like a one road east, which was actually the road that her house was on or which she had just moved to, and she thought she was on that road, and that stop sign at that T intersection came out of nowhere, and she couldn't she didn't have time to stop. I think there's these are all possibilities, and I don't think that we're ever going to know. Um for me. I wrote about this in one of the unfound books, and I thought that her brother uh, was the best suspect in her disappearance. It's, uh, I guess I was wrong. I don't know how anybody could have predicted that her car would end up in that particular retention pond. You look at it, it doesn't seem like it could hold a car, but it did, and it did so for 11 years, and it and uh, I'm guessing this wasn't the first time that somebody was out on that pond fishing or anything. So it's just, and I went through uh, how it essentially happened was that that retention pond had a habit of being very scummy and algae and everything didn't look very nice. And the HOA decided they were going to do something about it. So they got some chemicals to kind of clear it up, make it look nice. What that did was it made the, the water really, really clear, like a, like a swimming pool. And then these kids went out in this boat and saw a glimmer, a glimmer of the sunshine bouncing off something shiny or metallic. And they let their dad know. The da dad called the police, and they, they dragged uh, the car out of there with Esther in it. Um, very lucky. As I continue to say, if we're going to rely on luck to solve some of these disappearances, then I think we're going to be waiting a long time, even though it does seem that luck does solve them. I guess you could say that about Crystal Morrison's uh, disappearance as well. So uh, Esther has been found. Uh, I talked to Matilda uh, not long after this all happened. She was, of course, uh, heartbroken. I think, she, of course, she's going. I think she's going to uh, continue to be that way for a while. And for all those people who cared about Esther, maybe in the area, I, I guess in looking back, it has to be very strange for, uh, to them that they were driving by that retention pond every day. They're wondering where Esther was, and here she was in the water the whole time. But uh, this is what I can continue to say. It's bittersweet. It's bitter in that we now know that Esther is deceased, but I don't know if the sweet side of it actually works, but now... Um, her family, everybody cared about her, now knows what happened, and they can, they got to bring her home. Completely bittersweet, uh, but uh, I'm going to continue to think about Esther's disappearance and the solution to it uh, for a long time, and I'm sure I'll be applying it to other disappearances we cover from now until Unfound ends, whenever whatever day that is. Next disappearance is Jennifer Wilkerson. Uh, there's really no update, but I keep talking about it. I, it seems like she gets mentioned to almost every uh, update episode because uh, we have been working on something, and it's just uh, this 2020, year of 2020, has been so strange in so many ways that wouldn't you know it would take us all of 2019 uh, to get our hands on some information we've been looking for. And then when we get it, and I need for a particular person to take a look at it, uh, but uh, she has some things going on due to everything going on in 2020. So, and I haven't talked to her recently. I probably should put that on my list of things to do. But um, things have just gotten sidetracked on that uh, disappearance. Um, 
I, I continue to say that continue to say that we happened upon something regarding uh, the investigation of her disappearance, and let's just say that uh, looking at somebody who we believe knew her but did never came forward to say so. <laughs> let's just put it that way. And so we're looking to see if that's actually true or not, and there's reason to believe that it's true, and there may be some reasons to think that it's not true, but we had to file a FOIA to get our hands on some paperwork, but uh, neither myself nor my assistants are in the best position to do, to do that. Uh, it has to be looked at, this stuff has to be looked at by somebody outside of our group, and that person just has her hands full right at this second. So uh, once again, though, I'll have to maybe talk to her about it and see what uh, we can make happen. But we're continuing to work on it. Just uh, it's kind of like so many other things, uh, 2020 has brought a lot of stuff to a standstill. Next disappearance, Kent Jacobs. Uh, all I can say about this is there was a hope uh, just maybe to go, maybe I should do this, maybe I should go over the disappearance, uh, at least the generalities of it. It is believed by people, including uh, the person who I consider to be the expert on Kent's disappearance, Dennis Mahan, who I've not talked to recently. He's a good guy, but I've just been a few months. But um, he believes that Kent is on a particular piece of property, uh, that uh, information regarding Kent's body being in a refrigerator that was buried on buried on this land that was kind of a landfill area that this guy had well that guy died and then uh, a relative or his son got ownership of it or something and there was the hope that uh, this guy would allow uh, investigators to go on there and they started to go on there and then something popped up and paperwork and everything and now it's I, I guess it's kind of in limbo and everything has come to a screeching halt. So even despite uh, the person who owned the land not even being alive anymore, um, doesn't seem that the investigation into Kent Jacobs' uh, disappearance is going anywhere right at this second. Uh, maybe this landowner will change their, his or her mind. I, I don't know, but um, it's come to a screeching halt. I think there was a lot of hope. I think last year in 2019 that um, they could be able to look for this alleged refrigerator, and but we have to. The problem is, if it's a landfill that this guy was running, probably illegally, there could be many refrigerators on his land. So it might not be as easy as maybe we, the public, think. But you at least need to have that chance to get on there with a backhoe and other digging equipment to see. And it doesn't sound like that's going to be happening anytime too soon. I now want to talk about uh, the disappearance of Chris Turner. Uh, if there was ever a disappearance that Unfound has covered, it, this particular one has run the gamut from him going missing to there being kind of investigation, and then certain people said that they saw him alive, so the investigation was shut down. And at the time that Unfound covered his disappearance in 2017, just a year after he had disappeared, um, it was closed. Las Vegas Metro had determined that he was still alive, he wasn't a missing person, and that continued for a while. And then his mother Dawn, uh, with help, um, uh, but surely Dawn was the, the spearhead, uh, you know, of, um, pushing this forward, but I think she got some assistance from some people. The disappearance case got reopened, so Chris was officially a missing person again, and now... Just within the last month, she found out that Chris's remains had been found, although they, at the time they didn't know, of course, that they were Chris's remains, that in April 2017, so not even a year after he disappeared, he disappeared in August of 2016, but in April of 2017 near Sunrise Mountain, if you'd like to find that on a map if you want to look that up, that is in the east uh, part of the Las Vegas Valley, although it's it's a valley, but it's uh, Las Vegas is 2,100 feet above sea level, if that makes any sense. Um, Sunrise Mountain, 
is on, of course, the east side. And it's a very well-known mountain. It's very prominent. Uh, everybody who lives in Las Vegas knows where it is. But his remains were found near there. Uh, coincidentally, I had a friend of mine and his wife who lived on Charleston Boulevard. And Charleston Boulevard ends at Sunrise Mountain. In fact, he and, he and she used to, I think, go up there hiking. But his remains were found there in 2017. So even at the point that uh, when she was on the program, very much like with Christopher Hyde's, with his sister being on the program and the remains being in the possession of um, law enforcement over in Hillsborough County, same way with Dawn being on Unfound in August of 2017, that his remains had been found a few months before that. It's just nobody knew that. And it took a while for, to get the DNA uh, done once again. Why did it take this long? I don't know. But you should know. And I'm not going to get into any theories or anything regarding this case, but you should know that he was found approximately eight miles from where he was living at the time. Um, you should also know that uh, just recently that given what happened, uh, it went to homicide. This case was no longer a missing persons case, but all the, everything they had was turned over to homicide. But um, from what I understand right now, the investigation is on hold. Um, this is, could be another situation, even though it was only um, eight months since uh, between Chris disappearing and his remains being found, but it doesn't sound like they were buried. Uh, my understanding is that the way they were found was by accident. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing that I've heard from Dawn or anybody else that they got a tip or anything to go look in that area. I don't know. But there was some group that might have even been affiliated with uh, law enforcement that was out there just doing on some practice or something, and they came across Chris's remains. Um, the details were a little foggy in that area. But um, they were found. And what Don told me was that they didn't, since they didn't know who they, whose they were, the remains got buried, took, collected them and put them in a cemetery, uh, unmarked grave. But I guess that Don is now going to get those back and uh, bring Chris home back to Reno. Um, so that's where we stand with the disappearance of Chris Turner. It's a lot of twists and turns in this one. Uh, of course, I think anybody who follows Unfound or follows Dawn on Facebook, she has her own theories regarding what happened, and I know that she's uh, not going to rest until she feels that this uh, Chris's death has been uh, investigated thoroughly. Um, but this is once again one of those situations where if the remains are deteriorated enough, it may be impossible to determine anything. We just don't know how much of Chris they, they got and whether they could determine anything from them. We just don't know that, at least not at the recording of this episode, August 26th, 2020. The next uh, disappearances, plural, that I want to talk about are Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman. I, I'm guessing that far as national attention goes their disappearances have gotten as much as more than most of the other disappearances we've covered on the program and that was even a, a fact before unfound covered the disappearance in the fall of 2017 when laura laura's uh, mother was on the program but so i think a lot of you have followed it have seen it not just on on the page or the discussion group on facebook but you've probably seen national news regarding all of this as well that uh, Ronnie Busick uh, has been charged. He's supposed to serve 10 years in prison for his part in the deaths of the Freemans and the disappearances of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman. But prosecutors in Oklahoma have said that if he can lead uh, investigators to the remains of Laura and Ashley, that he would get five years taken off that sentence. And that was that's supposed to happen by the end of this month, August of 2020, so Ronnie has about five days left. Um, he's already, I 
from what the news says, he sent them to some house uh, digging in a basement. I don't know how close this was to Welch, Oklahoma, or how close to where uh, the Freemans lived. I don't know. But uh, investigators went into this basement and dug around, found nothing. And I think that uh, right now, and even earlier this year, uh, people were going into wells and in the area trying to find any human remains. And, of course, nothing has been found. As far as Ronnie Busick goes, I, I'm not sure he knows something. I'm not sure he doesn't know something. Uh, I'd like to think that if he gets five years off of his sentence, that he would fess up and, and want to do that. But uh, it does sound like he has some sort of mental incapacity that I have read uh, is from him being shot in the 1970s. I don't know. Was he shot in the head and part of his brain was injured? Or was he shot and maybe circulation, kind of blood circulation, stopped going to his head so some of his brain cells died? I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but we know these things happen just like in car wrecks, other accidents, situations where people survive, but their blood circulation was low for a while and blood wasn't getting to the brain. And so they do suffer some um, mental in incapacity. I don't know if that's what's going on with Ronnie or he was just like that from birth or maybe he's just faking it. I don't, I don't know, but it doesn't sound like so far he's been very helpful uh, and he has been in custody for a while now, what, a year and a half at least. And Laura and Ashley are still missing. Uh, I, I think the, the feeling that I get from this even so is that it does not seem that Ronnie would have been, if this is true about him and he's been like this for a long time, that he would not have been the leader of the, the three who did all of this anyway. Of course, the two other guys are now dead, but he would not have been the leader. He would have just been a tag-along kind of guy uh, just wanting to take part or being forced to take part. I don't know, but he would not have been the leader in this. So I guess it is possible that he really might not have known what the, those other guys or one of the other guys did, you know, where they put Laura and Ashley. On the other hand, maybe he knew at the time back in 2000 and because of his mental uh, issues, he can't remember. I think that's possible too. Once again, I'm not a doctor, but if you're going to tell me that this guy has uh, uh, some sort of issues with his mind, brain that doesn't work like your average humans, then I think anything is possible regarding his memory and what he thinks and what he believes and what he remembers and if it, whether it's true or not. So, uh, starting to get the feeling on Laura's and Ashley's disappearances that... This may be one of those ones that if it's going to get solved, it's going to get solved by luck and not by a, a rational, logical process going from one step to the next to the next because there's really not anywhere to go if nobody can remember anything. As far as the other people, mostly women, who were around these guys back at that time in the year 2000 when all this happened... I think some of them are still alive. I think they've claimed they were afraid to say anything. They knew about Lauren Ashley. They'd seen the pictures of them being tied up and maybe even being allegedly tortured, etc. Uh, it doesn't seem like they've been any help in trying to locate these two girls either. So, I just don't know. But that's where I think the investigation stands at this point. I think what I'm saying here is... I'm going to be very, very, very surprised if Ronnie Busick actually leads investigators to the remains of Lauren Ashley. I'll be very, very surprised. Next disappearance would be Lucinda Hules. Uh, I don't necessarily have an update, but I thought this was a good time to bring up uh, something that's going on. I just mentioned uh, Hillsborough County a little while ago regarding Christopher Hyde's disappearance, but... The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office has started their own podcast. And I've not uh, just started within, what, the last month, six weeks. 
And I listened to the first episode, but I now understand they have at least three episodes out, and I've not listened to the other two yet. But um, because of that, I submitted to them the dis- a couple disappearances that we've covered in Hillsborough County over there in Tampa. Of course, Bonnie and Jeremy Degas, and who disappeared from Brandon, Florida, and Plant City area, Florida. And Lucinda Hules, who disappeared from uh, Tampa, the city, going way back to the 1980s, and Jeremy and and Bonnie in the 1990s. And um, what I discovered, uh, and I told uh, Bonnie Degas' mother, Linda, that I was going to do this. And here, uh, I was a little behind the times because she said that they had already contacted her and she had already done an interview that I guess will be on an upcoming episode uh, of this podcast that they're doing for, once again, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, trying to get the word out about some of these unsolved murders and disappearances from over in that county. Um, so, but I've not yet talked to Lucinda Hules' uh, daughter, uh, who was the inter- who was my guest way back then. Uh, to remind you uh, of Lucinda's disappearance, uh, that, uh, that disappearance was the one where uh, she went out with some friends to uh, a bar a nightclub that was run by the mob. And it was actually a nightclub that made an appearance in the movie Goodfellas. And she disappeared after going there. And her purse and, and some other items were found in a, in a restroom. Might have even been a men's restroom, but uh, across the street or near there in a park. You also remember maybe Lucinda Hules' disappearance because later a woman pretending to be Lucinda um, came back saying she was, and she was accepted back into the family. Um, Lucinda's husband and her kids accepted this woman in as being her. And of course, this person was an imposter. And in fact, I remember the title of that episode was The Real, was uh, The Real Thing was the name of that episode when we, covered that disappearance uh, going way back to, was it 2018, 2017, 2018. But, uh, so I'm hoping that they will take my recommendation, and I told them, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, that I have contact information for Lucinda's uh, daughter, who still lives in this area, and I'm sure she would uh, love to be on the, the program, you know, so Lucinda's Uh, disappearance could get uh, uh, more attention. Um, These episodes that Hillsborough County is doing are not long. I think the first one was like 12 or 13 minutes. Not like Unfound's two hours. But uh, being that a a police department is doing this, I think, is is really good. And I thought the first one that I heard uh, was well done. So they're going to... Bonnie and Jeremy's disappearance uh, will be coming out at some point and I'm hoping we can get Lucinda Hules' disappearance on that podcast as well. I, I can I, I can tell you what I believe regarding that disappearance. I, I can't help but say that I think that her friend and the friend's husband was there. I think they actually had something to do with Lucinda's disappearance. Uh, that's my opinion on that. And I, I, I forget why I think that, but every time I see her name, I see her face when I'm going through um, my files on my computer, I automatically think that so there must have been something during the course of um covering that disappearance interviewing her daughter me thinking about it me writing about it that causes me to think that and it continues to stay in my mind uh three years later next disappearance so once again this isn't one necessarily that has an update but i thought i would talk about it because it's weird uh, you, you don't necessarily plan for these types of things uh, when you cover disappearance, but if there is a disappearance in which uh, one a disappearance where I, I have gotten a lot of nasty emails, it has been the disappearance of Troy, Troy Galloway. Um, I don't know why that is. I would say since I've covered his disappearance, since we covered his disappearance, since Unfound covered his disappearance, I've probably gotten at least five or six nasty emails about that. Uh, I think mainly coming from friends of his wife's or actually her family. I don't think she's ever contacted me directly, but it seems friends of hers, family members of hers 
Every once in a while, I will just get something pop up in my email or there will be a post on Podomatic, something like that. I did not uh, print this particular email out or message out. Uh, in fact, I think I blocked the person. I think I deleted it and blocked the person. And uh, it continues to be this one, it, the way I remember it has something to do, you know, how when Troy's, you know, child is going to grow up, you know, he grows up, you know, what's he going to think hearing all these, you know, bad things about his mother? And, you know, the, the attitude I continue to have with uh, emails like this. Now, I've, like I said, I've gotten, I get a lot of crazy messages. I get, I get some nasty emails, messages, and uh, a lot of things. But there's nothing that interests me less than an email like that. What do you think he's going to grow? Well, maybe it might be that this child might grow up and think maybe the exact opposite thing. I mean, children do grow up, end up having their own thoughts and dreams and interests and everything. Well, what happens if this, I uh, think, you know, their child grows up and wants to actually look into Troy's disappearance? How about that? Why is why does any child have to believe what their parent says about a disappearance? We run into this a lot. We just ran, you know, ran into this recently with the disappearance of Jennifer Casper Ross, whose whose son was three years old when she disappeared, and now he's eighteen. And what's he doing? He's he's interested in his mother's disappearance and claims his father lied to him all this time. So when these people say, well, he, you know, he, Troy's, uh, is it son? I think it's son. Maybe it's daughter. I should have wrote that down. But when their child grows up, maybe he or she isn't automatically going to be on the mother's side. Maybe this child will be independent-minded. So that's my attitude uh, regarding any time I get something. Well, this child's going to think that their parent... I don't know what they're going to think. Hopefully, they'll just think for themselves. They don't have to believe me. They don't have to believe uh, Nancy, Troy's mother, who came on the program. All that I ask is that they think independently. I hope they do. Uh, we're not trying to force any belief down anybody's throat. All we're saying is Troy's missing, and here are the facts. And uh, so when I get a message like that from somebody, I am like, think, well, do you think that you know what this child's going to think when they, be, you know, the, the, the kid becomes an adult? You know, you don't. This child's going to choose to do what he or she wants and will handle the disappearance in his or her way. And I really don't know how much myself or Troy's mother is going to affect that. So... I just have no time for it. In addition, I have no time for the the occasional email I got. Well, that interview you did was nothing but lies, and they just leave it at that. Never list what the lies are. I can't believe you'd do that interview because it was nothing but lies. Well, you know, you could at least, if you're going to email me, tell me at least one or two lies. I mean, if you're going to take the time to write 75 words telling me how much of a liar I am and how much of a liar the guest was, You'd think you could go another 75 words and tell me a couple, what a couple of those lies were. Nobody ever does that. I, I, just, I just can't explain it enough to you. I wish I could show these emails to you, but uh, you'll just have to take my word for it. So I am usually very, very, very unfazed by these types of messages and saying how we're doing things the wrong way and, and everything else. Just totally unfazed by it. Speaking of family and friends. I now have to talk about the disappearance of Dal Phillips. Um, something popped up that, uh, and I talked to Dal's uh, wife, Missy, who I, I, to this day, I say is one of the most kind-hearted, soft-spoken guests I've ever had on the program, period, period. And uh, this is another one of those uh, disappearances where I have gotten the occasional um, 
nasty message. And I think it comes from Dal's side of the family um, and not even from people who live in Tennessee. I think he has some uh, family members who live in Ohio. But I've gotten a couple of those. And they seem to really, really, really dislike Missy for whatever reason. And they really want to point the finger at her, finger at her regarding um, Dal's disappearance. And her, of course, her story is that and she was the guest. She went to pick her mother up. He was there. When she came back, he was gone. And dogs allegedly followed a scent down the road. And they were suspicious of some guy that worked at some machine shop down down the road. And there was also, you know, some things going on between Dow and he was like a minister. And this uh, another member of his family who was a minister. There was something going on there. I urge you to go listen to that um, episode for yourself. Well, the reason I'm talking about it in this update episode is that, uh, and I just don't want to get too much into this, but Missy had approached me uh, telling me that there was an allegation coming from somebody on Dow's side of the family that actually Dow was still alive and he wanted to get away from Missy and he was doing this and he was doing that. Just, just walked out of his life and is now living... Uh, somewhere else. And there was an allegation uh, that came up, once again, is that, and I'm not going to give you the name, but he, that Dow was seen at a funeral that took place in another city in Tennessee where somebody he knew died and he showed up. So, um... Talk to Cherie about it and kind of put her on that. First person I always go to is Cherie. And he said, well, I, I know what the, I'm not going to tell you what the funeral was, but it was listed, the, the, the person, this person's wife, the people who attended, his children, brothers, sisters. And I, I kind of said this, you know, look some of these people up, see if you can get their phone numbers, email, see if you can contact them, and see if them, any of them want to admit that they saw Dow at the funeral home when this guy died, they were all would have been there because they were very close. Once again, wife, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters. Did any of them know Dow and did any of them see uh, him at this funeral? Uh, the answer is no. I, I really don't know how many people Sheree was able to contact, but um, it's an unequivocal that there is no proof that Dow was at this at this funeral. Now, I will also say that through some other channels uh, that I have that we've been able to check into his social security number. He's not taken any social security checks, nothing, zero, since he disappeared in Tennessee. So if he is out there, he is not getting the government check that he is entitled to get. And... Uh, it, it's just a little uh, stretches my imagination a little bit, all this, that these people come up with these allegations and you try to verify them and, and you just can't. And if there was any, ever be a thing that would show that um, somebody actually was alive, would something be something like a funeral home? In fact, I can remember in talking you know, to Cherie, well, yeah, I... I you know, having my, my mother just died a year and a half ago, that when you go in, you always, you know, sign your name. Yeah, you were here. And then the family gets, well, you could check the book. Did Dal, when he showed up, you know, sign it Dal Phillips? Or did he sign it, you know, John Smith? Or what did he do? Was he using some uh, assumed name? Just don't know. But there is no proof that of this uh, story that got... Uh, back to Missy. This seems to be just more uh, stirring of the pot by Dow's side of the family who, to me, sound like horrible, horrible people. Um, they're very suspicious of her, and, and, and I, uh, I, I just got to say, I would be blown away if Missy had anything to do with his disappearance, it would be one of the most startling, the number one most startling thing that that would ever have happened to this point regarding Unfound. Just totally 
I'd be totally floored by that. Whereas I think, you know, since we covered his disappearance at the end of 2017, is that we've learned more and more, I think, that, you know what, people do walk off. They do. They walk off and uh, die. And uh, Dow was going through some things. Health wasn't good. I think he was struggling with some mental health issues, physically and mental mentally. And sometimes that can just push people over the edge. And his wife leaves, and while she's gone, he decides to walk off. And they're out in the hills and mountains and forests of Tennessee. Good luck finding him. Good luck. But regarding this allegation, to this point, we have found no reason to believe that any of these stories that Missy has heard about him living in another city, him going to this funeral home and everything else, we found none of this to be true. Next disappearance is Zoe Campos. Uh, the update that I can give to all of you that I finally got to speak to her mother, Melinda. I have to tell you that I, I'm always in a difficult position in, in some of these situations because I deeply care about every person who has ever been on Unfound. Uh, and I consider them to be friends, uh, share a lot of tough moments together, even though I've only f met a few of them in person. Uh, but uh, I trust them. I think they trust me. They know that I can be very discreet. They know that when they talk to me off the record, that it's off the record. And I never want to make any of them feel like I'm pumping them for information. I'm only contacting them because I need, I want information. Uh, I do. That's my, I mean, I'm, a, I'm in the information business. Unfound is in the information business. We're not in the philosophical business. We're not in the law business. We're not in the entertainment business. We are in the information gathering business. That's what we're trying to do. And then report it to all of you. And so it's partly me being just a person wanting to talk to this person, see how they're doing. But on the other hand, there is the, the occupational side uh, of Ed Denzel as well. But so I'm always in this tough position. Well, I want to talk to Melinda. I want to find out what's going on. But I want her also know, you know, I, you know, I, I want to keep in contact with her, even if we're just going to talk and she has nothing to say and there's no nothing going on. I always want my guests to know that that's OK, too. And so I finally did get to talk to her. I had spoken to her. Uh, sometime probably in 2019, early 2019, after Zoe's remains were identified and Carlos was taken into custody. But it had been a while, but I got to speak to her maybe six weeks ago, sometime in July, I think. And we had a really good conversation. I like her a lot. And uh, she's, you know, I think she's doing the best she can under the circumstances. Uh, Carlos Rodriguez's uh, trial will not be happening, she told me, until 2021 for COVID-19 reasons. I don't think that's any surprise. I think, actually, that his trial, uh, he's planning to plead not guilty. And I think that, um, for, you know, he's using some sort of defense that, of course, he did not kill Zoe, that the drugs did it or something. You know, she was hallucinating or, or something like that. And, you know, he had nothing to do with her disappearance. He just had something to do with, of course, burying her body in his backyard. Uh, uh, Carlos, good luck with that. Uh, he's going to give it a shot. And I guess there's some d defense attorney who's going to represent him and... um try to prove that but um so that's what's going on we're all wondering you know it's been uh, you know the reason i remember the time frame is that uh sorry i just kicked the microphone stand there that you know her remains were found right around the time that my mother died in november of 2018 so that's kind of how i put that all together and so it's going to be end up being two years since carlos has been in custody it was you know, he finally said, yeah, you can find her in the backyard. And we still don't have a trial. Well, it, it sounds to me like it would have happened already had it not been for all the craziness that 
what's going on, at least on the virus side of 2020. But in fact, uh, you should all know, uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, is that Melinda has actually invited me to go with her to the trial when it happens. Um, that may be an invitation that's going to be hard to pass up. I'm not making any guarantees. I do not give her any promises. I'm not giving anybody out there any promises. But uh, I felt, uh, you know, so humbled that uh, that she asked me uh, to do that. Um, that um, it was a real surprise. So uh, really humbled by that. And see, that's what I mean. I, I These are the kinds of connections I want to have with all of my guests. I want them to understand, yeah, I, I have a job to do here. I'm in the information business, but I want them to also know that, um, you know, we're friends too. Now, maybe sometimes I have to give them some honesty that they don't like, but they know that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to kiss their butt and everything. And, and it, and, um, for Melinda to invite me to go to something I know it's going to be very, very difficult for her. I think she, of course, wants Carlos convicted, but the process of going, however many days it goes, going to be very difficult. That She asked me, totally humbling, total respect for her, and I've not, uh, I've not given her an answer yet. I think I've still got quite a while before I have to make that decision, but... I am certainly considering it, and I deeply appreciate her uh, asking me. The next disappearance that I want to talk about is Tom Brown's. Within the last month, I have revealed that I actually spoke to Pine Gregory one-on-one -on, -one on the phone last year. I believe it was November of 2019, and I want to thank my assistant, Cherie, for... Uh, making that happen. She tracked him down through email and uh, phone number and got a hold of him. He responded to her and then she set up a phone me meeting between myself and Pine. I want to tell you that he and I got along just fine. There were no accusations. I did not accuse him of anything. He did not accuse me of anything. We had just uh, a reporter to police officer or, or ex-police officer uh, conversation. Um, it was very cordial, and I am certainly open to talking to him again. In fact, I think that I can reveal that since I spoke to him last November, I've not spoken to him, but Cherie has remained, uh, remained in contact with him, maybe not even once a month, but I do know that They've had some emails back and forth. Um, the reason that I finally revealed that is because he had said something during our conversation back in November, and I decided that we should check that out. And what we checked out was this. Uh, going back to the videos, uh, once again, if you forget about the Tom Brown Abrahams uh, videos, please go to YouTube and look at those again, but there is one video that shows two uh, sheriff's vehicles um, in the one video. It's something that I personally discovered way back in 2018 when Penny, Tom's mother, had sent me the videos. That at approximately the time that Tom would have been at Franks, or maybe five or seven minutes after he would have been there, two sheriff's vehicles are coming from that direction. And if you want more of an explanation, please go to YouTube to uh, see the video. But I asked Pine about that. I thought I had an obligation to ask him and explain it to him. And I, at that point, cannot remember if he ever had watched the videos. I don't remember if he even knew what I was talking about. But I asked him, there are two vehicles, and he admitted that he was in one of them. And he said that Deputy D. Herrera was in the other vehicle. And he did verify that, yes, they were coming from that direction, but they were did not pass Franks. And his explanation was this, is that sometime around 11 o'clock on that night that Tom disappeared, 
Uh, D. Herrera, Deputy D. Herrera, had pulled over somebody for drinking and driving. And the person was pulled over at close to the intersection of Main Street and Nelson Street. And Officer or Deputy D. Herrera called in Pine to kind of back him up. They were going to do a field sobriety test, and we all know what that looks like. And what happened was that given that I think they, they decided that this guy was drinking or a person, woman was drinking and driving, that eventually after doing this field sobriety test and determining this person should not be driving, um, they put this person in the back of Deputy D. Herrera's SUV and that driver was taken to the local hospital, clinic, whatever it was, uh, to get a blood test. And so... What's important for all of you all of you to know is that where they stopped this driver was between where the video was taken and Franks. So they were like about halfway between there, but they had been there uh, since about 11 o'clock. This is what Pine was telling me back in November of 2019. It was not like they were coming in from out of town then past Franks, and then a minute later they're seen on video. That's not what happened. They had actually been, and you can check the map, um, at Nelson Street and Main Street since about 11 o'clock. And I think that works out. Uh, DUI stops, especially if they quickly determine that the person is uh, drinking and driving and they have to do all of the legal stuff, make sure, you know, touching your nose, walking in line, all that stuff. I think that's what happened that when they were done with that call, when we see them on the video, that is them leaving that call. And if you will remember, one of the vehicles turns away from the camera and goes down the street. The other one keeps going on Main Street, kind of going toward out of town. Um, so he said that. And so we decided that, well, let's check that out. Let's see if there was a DUI stop that night at that location where Pine described. Now, it took us a little time to get the information, um, but we got it. And it did verify what Pine said, that he and Deputy D. Herrera were, were on a call, I think starting at 10.55 p.m., and they were on this DUI call until approximately 11.30, 11.35, which once again lines up with them leaving that scene and then coming into view on that camera. So they did not pass Franks right before that because they were down the street from Franks. Now, what, what this means then also is that when Tom would have been leaving the junior high school and if he would have taken the normal closest direction to go from the junior high school to Franks, that he would have left the junior high school and then driven down to Main Street and had he looked to his right he would have seen the DUI stop occurring near the end of it, being that it was around 1130, but near the end of it. But he would have been turning left toward Franks, not right and passing where they were Pine and De Herrera would have been. He was turning a left away from them. And so that's why Pine says, no, I never saw him that night because Pine was down to the right while Tom was turning to the left. And so we verified that. Now I want you to know we are continuing to work on some other things that Pine said that I'm not going to talk about. It's not because I don't trust him. Um, but I think that I can tell you kind of what we're looking into. The other One of the other stories out there is that on the day of the search, um, Phil Klein has been saying that Pine Gregory was out there and not necessarily Phil Klein, but somebody that was working with Phil Klein or somebody that was involved in the search in official capacity, not a volunteer, but somebody in a leadership position for the search, but not Phil. I'm not claiming it was he. Um, claims that Pine Gregory was out there. He was in... Uh, in, in his uniform, out there, in a vehicle. And when this person tried to go down and search in a particular area, Pine would not let this person do that. 
And it just happens to be, this person claims, that that is the area where Pine eventually found Tom's remains. Now, you can see how that might be very um, uh, inflammatory. You know, that's a, that's a, quite a statement to make. Whereas Pine told me during our call last November that he was not even on duty that day. He was not out there that day. And so we are trying to get uh, his work records for that day to either prove that or disprove that. Um, once again, I'm not saying he's a liar or anything else, but somebody here is not telling the truth. Somebody is, I don't know who it is, but Pine says he wasn't there. Somebody else says he was there and was stopping them from searching. Pine claims that never happened, ever. So none of us were there to actually see this interaction if it happened. So all we can do is rely on records that we can get from the county of Hemphill, and we're trying to get those right now. Will they give them up? I don't know. But uh, we're trying to get that. All I know is what Pine told me about the DUI stop is absolutely 100% true. That at the time Tom was at Franks, he and Dio Herrera, although they were certainly close to Franks, within, I don't know, a third of a mile, a half mile, they were not at Franks, and they were on this DUI call. Now... The other point um, that I want to make about all this is Pine did tell me about how he encountered the uh, remains. And he told me about that and why he was out there. And it does go in line with all the other stories that he has told everybody else that is now out about him discovering the remains. He was out there looking for deer antlers and um, because they shed near that time of year, and he came across Tom's remains. And he remembers seeing um, Tom's skull in the distance. In fact, he I think the way he put it is it looked like a soccer ball because it was white. And he came up upon it. He called it in. He turned on his uh, badge cam, called it in, and that's how that all got started. Um, now, you should know there was a TV show just within the last few days, and I'm not going to get real deep into it, but... Um, in the TV show, they claim that Pine was out there at night. That's not how I remember it. I'm not saying... I, re I Maybe I just took it for granted, but in talking to Pine about him being out there and discovering Tom's remains, I just took for granted that it was during the day. Uh, did he explicitly say that? I can't remember. But the TV show said that he discovered them at night, and I just, for some reason, thought it was during the day. It very well may be that I just took that for granted. But on the other hand, the TV show might have gotten that wrong. So I want you to know I've talked to Pine Gregory. We talked for about an hour and a half. We covered a lot of subjects, but I've decided that I will only bring up issues that we talked about as we can uh, come across or I can tell you about things we're trying to do, verify what he said. I'm not going to get into to the entire conversation. I'm just not going to do that. Um, because I want to have uh, facts out there to back up what he said when I do talk about it. But I will tell you at least a little bit of what we're doing. And actually, we're doing some other ish, uh, things as well regarding Tom Brown's disappearance. But I would admit some of those issues do not invine, involve Pine at all. But um, So we're continuing to work on that behind the scenes. And I appreciate my assistant, Cherie, who has done such an excellent job in uh, her work, uh, getting the paperwork that I just talked about regarding the DUI and keeping in contact with Pine. And I want you to know that once we, a few weeks ago, when I talked about how we verified that he was telling the truth, he thanked us for doing that. I just want you to know. Some other things that are going on. Uh, allegedly, there's going to be a grand jury that's going to be convened. I spoke to Penny within the last few days. It has not been convened yet. I they Allegedly, Phil Klein is saying they have some suspects. I have no idea 
who they are or anything else. Uh, if I knew, I would at least tell you I knew, uh, but I wouldn't, of course, reveal their names. However, I know nothing about any of this. In addition, uh, within the last month, so I'm doing this in August of 2020, this month of August 2020, there have been some dogs that have been brought in to sniff around some particular areas in Canadian, particular buildings, particular houses. I don't know if they revealed anything. You know how I feel about dogs. They are very, very hit and miss. They're like polygraph tests. Sometimes they get it right. Oftentimes they don't. But there are still things going on uh, regarding Tom Brown's uh, disappearance. But my observation, as we get further and further away from his disappearance and from his remains being found, it seems that there, there are more and more theories. I guess you're either in the suicide camp or you're in the uh, he was murdered camp. But if within the murdered camp, um, there's like five or six different factions uh, within that. Um, whereas usually as you get further and further away from a disappearance, the theories narrow. In this particular one, it seems like they've widened. But that's all the information I can talk about right now regarding Tom Brown's uh, death. Next disappearance would be Bonnie Joseph. Uh, there's not really any um, update here, but I thought I was so happy to uh, admit her daughter into the discussion group just within the last few months. I did not realize that she wasn't already in the group, but Bonnie, I think Bonnie has multiple children, but I think this is her oldest daughter. Uh, she contacted me in, in identifying herself, and um, she wanted to be into, let into the group. And what she did was, once she got in there, she posted some additional pictures of her mother, and she thanked Unfound for the coverage of Bonnie's disappearance. So I was uh, so happy uh, that she uh, sought us out and uh, wanted to be in the group. Uh, she was very appreciative of us covering Bonnie's disappearance way back in 2018. So that just happened within, happened this past summer in June or July. And um, of course she is um, uh, permitted to contact me anytime uh, she wishes. So I'm happy to have her in the group finally. The next disappearance that I wanna talk about is Kimberly Norwood's. Unfortunately, there is no update on her case, but I thought all of you would want to know that her mother Janice uh, died um, back in, I believe it would be uh, June or July, certainly since the last update in April. I had not talked uh, to Janice in a while, maybe back in 2019, early maybe 2019. Uh, however, I do know that her husband, uh, Kimberly's father, died last year, like a year ago, and now uh, she died as well. I had, like I said, I had not talked to her in a while, but a listener who was in contact with her had let me know that Janice was not doing very well and that she had been admitted to the hospital, and then a few days after that, this same person let me know that uh, Janice had passed away. Um, this is the third, uh, unfound guest to pass away. Uh, the first was Jessica Curtis in October of 2018. And then Donna Jean Cap, um, sister of Dorian Myers, uh, died in October of 2019. And now Janice, mother of Kimberly Norwood, has passed away. So that's three. I should say that... Jessica Curtis is the sister of Tyler Stice, a disappearance we covered at the end of 2017. Uh, I have to tell you that all of these deaths uh, hit me uh, quite hard. I feel like um, I've let them down, that they had to live out their lives not knowing what happened to people they cared about dearly. And, of course, if you are of certain faiths, then you believe that, that they now have the answers uh, 
to the mysteries they were trying to solve while they were with us on the earth. Um, and I realize some people's faiths do not believe in that, and that's fine too. Uh, and I'm not going to get into my personal beliefs, but my job is to try to uh, fix things here in the material world on earth and not just try to say, well, this will all get worked in out after the fact. That's not my attitude at all. Uh, I believe in all of these disappearances. I know many of them crimes were committed, and it's our job as humans to try to solve them and bring the bad people to justice. We can't just wait around uh, for the afterlife, once again, if you believe in that type of thing. So these deaths hit me hard because I believe we have a job to do and we didn't get it done. Um, I guess the, the best news out of this is that Kimberly still has a sister. I've never spoken to her, but uh, she, uh, I think, is still very involved in getting Kimberly's disappearance out there and make sure people don't forget. We have to remember, Kimberly Norwood's disappearance is an old one going way back. So as we all know, it gets harder and harder to keep that in people's minds the, the longer we go. So I, I appreciate her sister, what her sister's going to continue to be doing. Um, maybe I can talk to her uh, one of these days. I certainly would, I think, like to do that. But I'm just um, very sad that we couldn't find out what happened to Kimberly um, before her mother and father died. Um, my personal opinion on it is that the best choice is still this guy who worked for them or worked on their land. I think that's still the best choice, but maybe it's just because I've not heard any other theories that, um, just to put it simply, I've not heard any other theories. So uh, unless Kimberly just walked off into the woods and got lost, I suppose that's possible. But far as anything else, the only thing I, the only theory I know about is this, this former, this guy who worked on uh, their property, and there was this alleged sighting of him on his motorcycle with Kimberly on the back of it. But I remind all of you, we know how unreliable eyewitness testimony is. So, Janice, I hope you rest in peace, and we will continue to do our best to try to figure out uh, what happened to your daughter. The next disappearance is the disappearance of Alyssa Turney. Uh, I think a lot of you uh, know about this, but maybe some of you don't. Uh, my perception is that uh, over time, Alyssa's disappearance in Arizona... Uh, has become nationally known uh, due to the work that her family, mainly her sister, uh, who was a guest on this program uh, back in 2018, um, the work she's been doing. And then uh, there was even a podcast uh, that's devoted entirely to Alyssa's disappearance. Uh, within the last, I'm going to say, three weeks, so maybe towards the beginning of August of 2020, her stepfather has been taken into custody. Michael Turney is his name. Once again, stepfather, not her biological father, stepfather. And has been charged with Alyssa's murder. Uh, I, I, On one hand, I'm a little surprised by it. On the other hand, I'm not surprised by it. Uh, the reason I am not surprised by it, because there's never been any other theory regarding Alyssa's disappearance that is believable. We know what Michael has said, but I've got to admit, he's a little biased. But for the rest of us, there's only been one choice out there, and is that is that Michael did something to her for whatever reason. And if you'll remember, just a very general facts is he, she went to school and then he picked her up halfway through the day uh, from school, and then he claims he went out somewhere. When he came back, she was gone. Um, the reason I am su surprised by it is because what I know about the case, and I'm not surely an expert on it. I covered it, but it was almost two years ago, and... 
the police surely have more facts, but I hope they do. At least publicly, this still seems like a very circumstantial disappearance and a circumstantial case that can be made against Michael Turney. Uh, what I, I don't know what has changed over all these years to go from him walking around a free man to him suddenly being charged with her murder. What did they find? Where did they find something? Uh, it's it's hard to say. Did some witness come forward that whatever he or she said can be backed up with actual facts and just instead of taking somebody's word? Uh, I'm guessing somebody knows that information out there. I don't. Um, and I, I've tried to keep up with it. I try to keep up with all of these cases. This is why I do these ep update episodes. But uh, it seems to me, at least sitting here in Clearwater Beach, Florida, is that it still is a bit circumstantial, and we always know that is risky. I, however, I will say this on the other hand that I've said this about a couple other disappearances where people have been charged, and then it turned out that police certainly did um, have um, more information. One uh, case in particular that comes to mind is Kamisha Hollis's that I'll be talking about here in a moment. But when we covered her case and her the father of her children was in custody, I was like, well, I hope they have more information that when we covered during the interview. And then a few weeks after that, the police came out and they certainly did have more information uh, connecting this guy to Kamisha's uh, disappearance. And that was uh, certainly great news. I'm totally happy with it. But I will admit that when I hear about uh, somebody being charged and I think I know the general facts of the case, I start wondering, you know, are they going too far with this? And we know maybe sometimes that, that that happens. Maybe a good example would be Angie Arnell's, where they ended up charging her husband with her death, and he only had to do four years, and she's still missing. Teresa Butler, that guy has gotten, I think, what is it, 12 years? She's still missing. So... Uh, it's good that these guys do jail time, but it still makes me feel a little unsatisfied, just to be honest. So I hope this isn't another situation where Michael Turney is charged with a murder. He pleads down to, let's just say, manslaughter, does five years. He gets out five years from now and she's still missing. I don't think that's going to satisfy anybody because the things you know, it's not solved. So I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that he is charged with their murder full blown. They do have all sorts of evidence, even if they may not get her body or find her body and he may not reveal where it is. And he spends the life rest of his life in jail. If that's the best we can do, I think that's decent. Although her being missing, it still sucks, but I don't want to hear anything about him spending five years in jail and he gets out in let's just say 2027 and she's still missing and he's just walking around free man nobody can do anything about it that will drive me and i think many of you nuts in this episode i've already explained a couple of the types of emails that i get not very often but i do get them uh, first of all it's the email that interview was nothing but lies. You should be ashamed of yourself. But then the person sending it never explains what those lies were. You don't know how much that happens. It's quite a bit on a multitude of different disappearances we've covered. The other email uh, that I've already explained that I get is, how dare you talk about that? How do you, well, I maybe rephrase it. How is that child going to feel when he, he or she grows up and here comes across your uh podcast and you saying all these things and you're just saying all these bad things about his or her parent and as I've already explained well it very well may be though that that grown child may be thinking exactly the same way we do you don't know that that child's gonna just automatically side with his or her parent the kid may side with us so 
don't be so um, assured of your you know own beliefs of what you think's going to happen somewhere down the road when the, the kid gets to be 20 or 25 years old. The other kind of email I get is, and I, I want to talk about this in relation to Bobby Tennyson's disappearance, is that somebody emailed me within the, la like the last six weeks claiming uh, that this person may know something about the disappearance and, um, you know, how would this person get in contact with Bobby's uh, sister Tammy, who was the guest for that episode. And I get these, and they all sound the same. It's uh, every time I get an email like this, it's like this person doesn't sound like he or she really knows anything. This person, it sounds to me, is like it's just kind of digging around for information, whether because they want to sound like they're an expert, impress their friends, or they may actually have something to do with the disappearance and are trying to find out what's going on behind the scenes. I get quite a the, bit of those kinds of messages as well. And so I contacted Tammy and sent her a copy of the email, and it turned out I was exactly right. This is a person who really didn't know anything, was just nosing around for information, whether it was for a reason, one, just being nosy, or number two, because they're trying to see if anybody's on their trail for the disappearance of Bobby, I'm not sure. But uh, these things happen uh, more than uh, you know. I just don't really like to talk about them too much. But you get these people who claiming they know something, but what they tell you really isn't, you know, well, I know this and I know that and I know this and I know that. But then when you really get between the lines and really analyze what they're saying is you say, well, that's really no different than what's already out in the public or what we already it was in some news article you know, years ago or something we talked about during the interview or something I've said on the live show. It's really not secret information. It's been out there for quite a, a, a while. And so I guess my spidey sense uh, tingles when I get uh, an email like this. But I do pass it on to the guest. But I tell the guest, here's what you need to know. Here's what I think this message is it, what this messenger is trying to say and what he or she wants. And it may not be what they say in the email. And I ended up being right. Um, but, and that's one of the things we do behind the scenes here. When we do get information, we do pass it along to the guests. Uh, and it's always with uh, our particular insight into that information. You know, be careful. Watch this, watch that. Don't give this person any money. Uh, don't meet this person anywhere, no matter how much you, you may believe the person. It goes with all of those caveats. And so these types of emails, I explain to the guest, this person may know something that nobody else knows and may be helpful, but in this message, I'm not reading anything that's, that's not in the public already. I thought you might, all might find that interesting. The next disappearance I want to talk about is Travis Murrow's. When I think back to Travis's disappearance, I think this is probably one of the first ones where I decided, you know, doing these maps on YouTube can really help people out. And I think you will see that since this particular disappearance was covered last year, I've done a lot more YouTube videos that are companions to the audio program of Unfound than I ever did before that. And it's one of the reasons that uh, I'm going back. In fact, I'm starting today after I'm done recording this episode and I'm going to be starting going back to the beginning, way back to 2016, looking at some of those uh, episodes and adding video to them. So be looking for those videos on Unfound's podcast channel on YouTube. Uh, with Travis Murrow, I can't say a lot, but there is something going on. And in fact, something was supposed to happen yesterday. I do not know what the results of that were. But I will tell you that I've been contact in contact with Christy, his ex-wife, who was the uh, guest for that episode. 
I thought she did a great interview um, last year. But there are some things that have popped up within in recent weeks. Once again, I can't talk about them. I don't think I have permission to talk about them publicly. But um, they're definitely uh, on the case there. I don't know where this is going to go, but um, Christy uh, is keeping tabs on it. We have to remember that she is not, uh, when he disappeared, she, she was not Travis's current wife. She's the ex-wife. She's been married again. So I don't know how much information she's going to get, get that's going to be secret because she's an ex-wife and the current wife. It very well may be that Travis's children, the, the children they have together, get the information first. That's very possible. But um, there's something going on, and it's been brewing, I would say, for a few weeks and that's all I can say. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, and uh, I don't want to get in the way uh, of anything that law enforcement is doing there. But some things are going on. I don't know where. It may end up being nothing. I, I'm not saying that his disappearance is going to be solved a week from now. Um, I don't know. But it's it's good to know that something is happening. And if you, to remind you about the basic facts of his disappearance, he was driving from Enid. Uh, he was going to be driving to a woman that he knows house. And for some reason, he didn't get there. And his truck was found abandoned, out of gas, on a road that probably he shouldn't have been on if he was going directly from where he lived to where this person lived. It's hard to explain how the truck ended up on this particular road uh, if he was um, going the most uh, direct route or most efficient route. Now, I've had some people in the area contact me and said it wouldn't be unusual for him to be on that road, but I have to tell you, these people have told me that have never adequately explained why that is to me. I've never been to that part of Oklahoma, but it's hard for me to understand what they're explaining to me. It seems maybe they are uh, rationalizing something that can't be rationalized, at least. I, I would like to think that um, if I lived in an area for a long time and people driving on particular roads, that I could explain it to outsiders. These people have not done a very good job of explaining it to me. So I'm going to continue to believe that Bobby's truck shouldn't have been where it was if he was taking the most direct route from point A to point B. Something's going on. When I can reveal more, I'll do so. The next three disappearances I think I could wrap up into just all the same comment, and that would be Austin Pivos, Jonathan Estes's, and Kamisha Hollis's. Uh, in all three, trials are due to happen, but due to uh, COVID-19 here in 2020, they've all been pushed off. With Austin's, uh, in, it's in regards to the three men who people believe are responsible for his death. Um... The trials have been delayed. Two of them were supposed to happen, I believe, in early June. That did not happen. I do not know if they've rescheduled them. Uh, his mother, Susan, has not uh, informed me of that, and I think she would because she and I have uh, certain, certainly kept in contact uh, quite often since she was on the program, and she's been keeping me uh, apprised of what's going on. She has not yet told me w when those new when the trials are going to happen, what the new dates are. Jonathan Estes, um, the trial for his wife, Cindy, in regards to the alleged theft of a bobcat. She took it, she sold it to somebody, it was finally tracked down. And her trial uh, was supposed to happen in November, it got delayed until this year. Well, it's still not happened. Um, she is uh, continuing to plead not guilty despite these delays. I believe that her defense is that she thought she was allowed to sell that. I think that's going to be her defense. But uh, I don't even know, even if she's convicted, uh, if she's going to jail time or fine or whatever else, I don't know. But um, 
she's not pleading out, it seems. So that trial hasn't happened yet either. And Kamisha Hollis, uh, same thing. Uh, her uh, The father of her children is in custody, and that has been delayed as well. Um, if you'll remember, he was... Um, Although they were living together, have children together, he was stalking her. If she was at work, she had to have her phone like on a video so he could watch her. And then she turns up missing, and they have um, they were looking for her. And the process found him walking down the street, walking away uh, from her car where he parked her car, and they have video of him driving it in there and doing a variety of things with the car. So uh, people believe that he murdered uh, Kamisha. But his trial uh, has not yet happened yet either, and probably will not happen this year. The next disappearance I want to talk about is Jesse Ross's. There are no updates regarding his investigation, but what I want to tell you all about is a documentary called When I Last Saw Jesse. It is now viewable on YouTube for free. Um, I've not had a chance to watch it yet. Just too busy doing too many things. It's uh, an hour, I think, and 20 minutes long. Just going through it very quickly, just like clicking down the timeline as you can on YouTube. Seems there are pictures taken from uh, that uh, United Nations uh, conference, mock conference, I guess, in Chicago of that year. And it seems like it is filled with a lot of uh, different pictures and video of Jesse and other other things in his life. So I hope to watch it here soon. Once again, uh, if I'm going to watch it, I want to be able to concentrate on it alone and nothing else. Whereas I have to be honest, that's not usually how I watch things. If I have things on TV or even if I have Netflix on my phone or Disney Plus or whatever... I'm usually doing like three things at one time. I'm usually um, doing unfound. If I put something on the TV, I'm usually doing unfound work. And then maybe I'm going out. And during that, I uh, to take a, a mental break, I'll go out and maybe practice my disc golf putting, then come back and do some work, and it'll still be on, on the TV, whatever movie's playing. It's hard for me to just sit down and watch something for an hour and 20 minutes and just do that, nothing else. But I think that, of course, with my work, that's what I have to do uh, uh, for this particular film that was made. So I need to make the time. I need to get it done, but I haven't. I will tell you this, though, just in scanning through it very quickly on YouTube, it looks like it's very well done. So I would urge you to check it out. Once again, it's called When I Last Saw Jesse, and it's now available for free on YouTube. So I would just do a search for that, and I think... That search will take you directly to the uh, the movie. The next disappearance is Mary Jane Van Gilders, uh, the oldest disappearance that we've ever covered on the program. Um, thanks to one of Unfound's listeners, I'll just say her first name, Lisa, she has uh, has or had experience in a particular area regarding old documents. And after hearing the episode regarding Mary Jane's disappearance, where I had the officer, the investigator, who is responsible for her disappearance, he's working on it very diligently all these 75 years later, uh, Lisa heard that episode and believed that her expertise, her experience could help in trying to track down more information about Mary Jane, in particular her work history, addresses, um, what she was doing in those months in Ohio before she disappeared. And Lisa was successful. Uh, of course, if you go back to the interview uh, that I did, uh, it was believed that a lot of those records might have been or, or not might have been, but people believe they were destroyed uh, in, in a fire at some warehouse in St. Louis back in the 1970s. Turns out that that was not true, and given Lisa's experience, she kind of suspected that that wasn't true. And she was able to point uh, uh, the guest, 
uh, the investigator, the police officer, in that particular direction. And because of that, this information, a lot of additional information was found on Mary Jane uh, and this, um, what is it, Mysterious West Virginia YouTube channel has now recently used that information to make another um, video regarding all of this. And I watched it. Uh, it's very well done. It's very well done. So I would urge all of you to check it out. I don't know uh, where it's going to lead. I, I don't know if any of the information that was recovered, uh, that was found, uh, can help explain her disappearance. But it certainly gives more background of, of what she was doing at the time. And probably the the point, and so I really, first of all, I really want to give a huge shout out to Lisa for um, that work. Just spectacular. This, these are the types of things that when I talk about people getting involved, this is what I mean. Uh, I, and some of you may be thinking, well, I don't have any expertise or, you know, and well, you never know. I, I'm not sure that when Lisa started listening to Unfound that she ever knew that knowledge that she had would be eventually applicable to a particular disappearance. I don't know that, but it ended up being true. So never count yourself out. Never think that, well, I don't have the ability. I don't have the experience. I don't have the knowledge. Well, you just never know what we're going to run into uh, in some of these disappearances, something that just catches your ear and says, oh, you know what? I think I do know something about it. I may not know anything about the disappearance, but I may know something about this. I may know something about that. You just never know what we're going to run into from week to week with these disappearances. Well, for Lisa, it had to do with old records. And um, just this is the type of stuff I mean when I talk about listeners getting involved even it doesn't mean uh, you have to commit the rest of your life to it but it could just be simply knowing you know I have knowledge in this area and I'm gonna pass this along to the guest something as simple as that can go a long way now what I get out of this new information uh, in this uh, documentary once again it's uh it's the second video that uh, this guy I think his name Sean McCracken has done uh, regarding Mary Jane Van Gilder's disappearance, what I get out of it is she was in one particular job and then she applied for another type of job within the warehouse, a uh, forklift operator, something like that. I'm guessing that that would have probably been uh, an increase in pay given it's maybe a little bit more of a skilled position than than what she was doing before. But then, just a few weeks later, she decided that she was going to be leaving and gave uh, the company, that warehouse, uh, 15 days notice that she was leaving. And the reason was, as we talked about in that episode, that she um, had, she had uh, further household duties, something, something like that. Well, the confusing part is that she was living by herself at least as far as anybody can tell, what further household duties uh, did she have? And, and I, I'm inclined to also think that if it was a fact that, you know, she was going to be moving back to West Virginia, I think she would have just said that. Well, why, why are you leaving? What's your reasoning? Well, I'm moving back to West Virginia. Okay. But that's not what she said. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out there. You know, I don't do a lot of theorizing on the episodes and the only theorizing I ever do is when I write the Patreon blogs, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, but I'm going to throw something out there that somebody would apply for a, a higher paying position and then a few weeks later change their mind and decide, well, I'm leaving the job totally. I think it comes down to two things. Either one, she actually did find, maybe she found a better job. She was going to be maybe getting that forklift op operator job and then thought maybe she applied somewhere else and got that job. There's no record of that, though. And during this uh, documentary, they do reveal her 
social security number, which is the first time I can ever remember somebody doing that, but they explain that in the, in the documentary the, on YouTube if you want, you're going to watch it. The other thing that occurs to me is maybe she got pregnant. In the process of her uh, applying for this other job, then she discovers she's pregnant and she thinks, well, am I going to be able to do that job? Is it worth me moving over to this new job? And then, you know, being pregnant, doing this job, can I do that? And maybe she didn't want to let anybody know. Of course, um, most likely the father was not her husband back in uh, West Virginia. And we know how people, you know, things, of course, change, have changed regarding that since 1945 till today. And women uh, were much more secretive secretive regarding that back then as to today. Of course, culture has changed. And she couldn't just come right out and say that she was pregnant. And so she just said further household duties. I guess having another child would, of course, increase your household duties. Um, the issue is that after this paperwork that they have in Ohio, it seems there's no more paperwork. But at least we maybe understand a lot more of what she was doing, where she was living, where she was going, uh, who she was writing about in these documents, who her references were, who they were, and maybe they can deduce something from all of that. So I would check that out. Once again, I think it's called Myster Mysterious West Virginia. I think if you just do a search for Mary Jane Van Gilder, you will find the most recent video that's just done, I don't know, within the last week um, here in August of 2020. So I would check that out and you will um, see what I'm talking about during this update episode thought it was well done and a sh huge shout out to lisa for certainly moving the investigation along next will be eric alvarado this is once again a situation where i don't have any updates regarding the investigation but i do have uh, something i want to tell all of you regarding uh, eric's uh, case um as I mentioned in the news section of this episode, I'm going to be uh, a monthly guest on her show starting in September, this new show she is starting in conjunction with Nova Southeastern University. I've already done a couple interviews with her. I think they've gone very well. Uh, like uh, Dr. Telesco a lot. We get along very well. Uh, have a lot of the same uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, I, I think that... Uh, it shows when we've done the, the these two interviews so far. But in September, September 24th, I will be on this new show she is doing. And we will be discussing the disappearance of Eric Alvarado. I've already sent her uh, the episode uh, so she could listen to it. And uh, I think there was a video as well that I did for that one. I, I think I did. If not, maybe I will have done it by the time September 24th rolls around being that I'm going back and redoing uh, and doing some additional videos. But we will be discussing uh, his disappearance. I had sent her, um, I think, three different ones for her to, f from which she could choose. And she picked this one. If you'll remember Eric's disappearance, he was at home. Uh, with his wife and children, and then he took off. He was from in Texas, and then his vehicle was found just over the border in Arkansas. This is a disappearance where his dogs were also killed. Maybe that sticks out to you. And uh, his, I think his shoes were found, and his keys were found hung on the, the fence uh, near where his vehicle was found. And we will be discussing that uh, disappearance in September and I've not yet picked out uh, we've already had uh, a schedule set up for October November but I've not yet picked out the disappearances we will be discussing for those ones but I have picked out Eric's for September really looking forward to it uh, always enjoy talking to Dr. Telesco whether it's publicly like all the interviews you've seen or even uh, behind the scenes so be looking for that September 24th 
Next, I want to talk about Jacob Paddock Weeks, and I am very, very pleased to say that this is another situation where a listener heard the episode and uh, is getting involved. There is, I want to read this, uh, so I'm going to take a second to make sure this comes up on my screen. I want to read this to all of you. There's going to be a search. What One of the main points that I think came out of my interview with Jacob's uh, father and stepmother is that his disappearance, dis even though it's been like a year and a half since he disappeared, there's been never been a really thorough search in the area where uh, he wrecked his truck. Some people maybe believe he really didn't wreck his truck, but a lot of people do believe it was it was Jacob in the vehicle. But whether it was he in the truck or not, um, there's never been a search in that area for a variety of reasons. Um, but this uh, listener who lives in the area took it upon herself, contacted uh, Jacob's family, and they are now putting together a search team, and they are asking people in the area, and I'm just going to read this. Uh, I'm not going to paraphrase. I'm just going to read what's been written. Hello to anyone in Colorado or the surrounding states. We have a search scheduled for Jake Paddock Weeks uh, missing since February 2nd of 2019 on September 19th slash 20th of this year. And once again, I'm recording this on August 27th, and this is coming out on August 28th. So you have about three weeks. If you'd like to be involved, you have about three weeks to make that decision. The search is being organized by Justice Takes Flight. If you will be in the area or you can help in any way, please reach out to uh, Jacob's Paddock Weeks missing page on Facebook or to George Weeks, who also has a an account on Facebook. And I, he's on there all the time. I see him on there uh, posting things, so I know he's on there. So I know if you send him a miss it message, he will get it immediately. So once again... Uh, there's going to be a search sep September 19th and 20th of this year. The search is organized by Justice Takes Flight. If you can be in the area or you can help in any way, please e reach out to Jacob's uh, missing page on Facebook or contact George Weeks, his father, directly. Uh, this uh, post further says that this is our last shot before the snow flies here in the Rockies to get this area searched thoroughly we need some hiking feet and helping hands please if you have any questions you can also post here or reach out to me thank you i'm not going to reveal the listener's name but um that's what she posted and i think that gives you more than enough information if you want to get involved please do so once again go to jacob's uh paddock jacob paddock weeks's missing page on facebook contact uh send a message uh, to that page or contact George Weeks on Facebook um, directly. Now, if you're not, not on Facebook, and I know many of you out there do not use Facebook, if you want to contact me, I think that I can facilitate getting George's email address to you, but I'm not going to give that out uh, over the air because that's how spam and everything else uh, starts happening. But if you don't have Facebook, but you'd like to be involved, you can make it on September 19th or 20th. But you don't have Facebook, contact me. Email me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com, and I will send you uh, his email address so you can contact him, contact him directly to uh, get involved. Very happy to hear about this. I think this is uh, the main point that came out of the episode that... Some searches just need to be done. Now, we know with searches, it's a double-edged sword. You hope to find something, but on the other hand, maybe the family's hoping we don't find something. But you do searches to rule, not just rule in things, but to rule out things, to rule out facts, to rule out points. And... We already know, especially with the disappearances uh, and recovery of Tom Brown, the disappearance and recovery of Chris Turner, that you don't want to wait this, you know, wait this out. You don't want to take too much time before somebody disappearing and a search is being done because it very well may be 
that then cause of death can't be determined, as we learn over and over and over. So it needs to be done now. Yes, it should have been done a while ago, but, um, and I'm not blaming that, of course, on Jacob's family. These uh, organizing searches is a tough business. It's tough to do, especially in this area where um, it is mountainous, a lot of woods, a lot of rough terrain. It's not like trying to do a search outside of Las Vegas like I did back in April of 2010 where you're just out in the desert, it's all flat, and it was April and it was like a nice 70 degrees out. This is not that. So I understand the difficulties. There's no blame to be had here, but uh, to be given anywhere, but I think that this is the right thing to do at this point. And um, I... Uh, uh, once again, though, it's a double-edged sword. Am I supposed to say that I hope they find something? Once again, I, I, it needs to be done just because it needs to be done. And you look at where he might have run and figure out what needs to be done next. Maybe then they can do another search uh, once the weather clears up. But this has to be done, and I hope if you live in the area, you will take part. I, part. I will even tell you that my assistant, Sheree, has told me that her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend and some friends are going to be taking part in this. So even in Unfound's family here, um, that uh, some people are going to be involved, and I really deeply pre appreciate uh, Sheree's daughter uh, taking the initiative to be involved. The last update I have for you for this update episode is on Frederick Joseph Baines. Uh, I've spoke to Jolene recently because of the uh, privacy of the the conversation. I can't go into a lot of details, <clears throat> but I, I think her being on the program, uh, my opinions, all of your opinions, what people had to say uh, in the discussion group, um, messages and, and emails that were sent to her regarding her appearance on Unfound. I think it's kind of a little another fire in her, and she's certainly gotten to work since she was on the program, since that episode played. And um, she's already, I don't know where it's going to go, but it seems to me that she's found out a little bit more information, And but I don't think when she told me it was permissible for me to talk about publicly. She, of course, can go into the discussion group um, and talk about it if she wishes to post anything there. Or she is more than... Uh, ha she can um, certainly tell me, yes, Ed, you can tell everybody what I'm working on. But she has not done that, so I'm just going to keep it to myself. But this is a situation, and it, and it happens often, where... A guest maybe is kind of uh, kind of let things go maybe for a little while. Just to be used the word maybe gotten a little lazy on things he or she should have been doing. Appears on the program, gets a lot of great feedback. And then once again, that, that fire is lit again. And they start, you know, looking at all their choices and looking at new paths of inquiry. And that is what Jolene is doing. And uh, if she allows me to talk about the specifics, I will do so. But she's not done that yet. But I think uh, she's very excited about it. And uh, I hope she gets some uh, new facts to go along with all of the ones that we talked about uh, when she was on the program. And now, if you could pause whatever you are doing as a sign of respect for all the missing people featured on Unfound, as I read off their names. Suzanne Lyle, Jason Jolkowski, Jesse Foster, Rosemarie Gayhart, Ben Padilla, Kelly Rothwell, Joshua Guimond, Donnie Smatlack, Andrea Bowman, Robin Abrams, Regina Marie Boss, Christopher Hyde, Jeff Nichols, Rebecca Gary, James Walker, Teresa Butler, Charlotte Paulus, Lola Catherine Fry, Eric Franks, Jeff Joseph, Donna Michalenko, 
Dave Medot, Kent Monroe, and Omar Shearer. Claudia Wells, Peggy and Patty McDaniel, Shannon Turner, Brandy Wells, Clashindra Hall, Ronnie Russell, Esther Westenbarger, Shane Fell, Ashley Eifert, Brandon Williams, Craig Freer, Pamela Golden, Chip Campbell, Amanda DeGuio, the passengers and crew of Flight 370, April Pitzer, Jennifer Wilkerson, Kent Jacobs, Aaron Gilbert, Tammy Leppert, Crystal Morrison, Chris Turner, Linda K. Carroll, Nikki McCown, Helen Diamond, Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, Lucindy Hules, Ashley Kohler, Debbie Lowe, Patrick Beavers, Clinton Nelson, Troy Galloway, Patty Action, Danielle Bell, Evelyn Hartley, Dow Phillips, Tyler Stice, Bill Underhill, Patty Taylor, Aaron Barnard, Jeremy Burt, Brian Sullivan, Nikki Wells, Marina Bolter, Mandy Stokes, Greg Brooks, Rebecca Henderson, Dominique Holly Grisham, Tiffany Daniels, Nicholas Masucci, Donald Irwin, Billy De Silvestro, Renee Yergain, Mikkel Biggs, Al Copper, J.R. Mollahan, Jamie Bowen, Travis Robertson, Rosemary Rapp, Kristen Modafferi, Zoe Campos, Sean Ginyard, Thomas Brown, Amanda Fravel, Julie Early, Ellen Sloan, Renee Lamana, Nico Lisi, Leah Peebles, Melissa Hasley, Kimberly Raymer, Stephen Kocher, Bonnie Joseph, Immaculate Basil, Bobby Campbell, Kimberly Norwood, Alyssa Turney, Bobby Tennyson, Dale Kerstetter, Lacey Buenfil, Peggy McGuire, Jansen Brewer and Daniel Braden, Robert Cox, Lucas Degerness, Stephen Adams, Ashley Summers, Bonnie and Jeremy Dagus, Judith Emke, Jessica Hamby, Tim Beauchart, Devin Bond, Juanita Nelson, Desiree Ferris, Angie Arnell, Deborah Asbury, Sean Kosky, Mary Lands, Devin Brown Busetta, Shanna Boydo, Travis Murrow, Keith Fetter, Layla Faulkner, Megan Lancaster, Kelly Sims, Jack Hemby, Barbara Frame, Dorianne Myers, Austin Pivo, Christine Hamilton, Monica Appleton, Jonathan Estes, Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, Donnie Martin III, Kamisha Hollis, Lisa Wallace, Tammy McKittrick, Julie C., Stephanie Clemens, Andy Chapman, Trevor Nichols, Tiffany Johnson, Tyler North, David Kesey, Lucero Princess Sarabia, Brandy Myers, J.L. Hamblin, Bradley Allen, Timothy Guy, Ronald McNutt, Cameron Remmer, Tammy Arthur and Chad Peters, Jesse Ross, Lisa Shuttleworth, Jackson Miller, Patrick Reed, Jeremy Goodwin, Mary Jane Van Gilder, Phyllis Corbin, Eric Alvarado, Cassandra Ramirez, April Andrews, David Hardy Jr., Dennis J. Lushball, Christy Nichols, Christopher Sanders, 
Danielle Sleeper, Julie Wefflin, Shelva Rafty, Rodney Kaiser, Christina Branham, and Christopher Mittendorf, Gregory Howes, Brian Cook, Charles Thompson, Jessica Garino, Jacob Paddock Weeks, Jackie Bucky Letney, Frederick Joseph Bain, Vanessa Oren, Jennifer Casper Ross. Please do not forget these people, and please, if you have the time and passion, help one of these families find the answers they deserve. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.